Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena. This week I'm going to be installing what I think and hope is maybe the best price to performance wind vane available on the market. Inside of this giant 40 kilogram heavy wooden box is our new Pro Vane self steering gear or wind vane. The Pro Vane should be able to steer the boat by itself without using any electricity and without any electronics. And it'll also give us a bit of redundancy in the shape of a completely separate rudder. My name is Mess, this is my wife Ava. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit of our 1987 Warrior 38 named Athena. That was a DIY fun packed adventure complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, rebuilding the entire deck, gutting and subsequently rebuilding most of the interior, painting the top sides and a ton of other projects. The summer of 2021 we started cruising full time. Now we're finally ready to begin our adventure. Let's get the Provane liberated from its very sturdy packaging and then I can touch on why we went for this specific wind vane. <laughs> I have yet to meet a single boat owner that doesn't appreciate a big giant box of shiny stainless steel. Here's all the doohickeys that were in the box. There are a couple of these that I ordered extra. There are some backing plates here and also this custom bent tiller. I didn't order this bottle of rum. I'm assuming this is included to make the installation experience even better. I'm really impressed with what I've seen so far. All the stainless bits are nice and shiny, the wells look decent and the rudder looks really good. Like I mentioned this is called a Provane and I believe they're built in Estonia. There are a couple of really cool things about the Provane compared to the other wind vanes that are available on the market. One is price. The Provane we paid 2200 euros for. It may sound like a chunk of change but compared to something like a hydro vane that's typically in the six to eight thousand euro range this is pretty much a bargain and also because the pro vane is a very small company they can make little customizations to your wind vane like for instance this custom bent tiller here that should hopefully be able to clear the cockpit combing on athena they also made a custom vane that's the floppy bit that sits up in the wind and actually makes the wind vane steer that will fit underneath athena's solar arch if you're not familiar with a wind vane, you might be wondering why the heck do you need one? Well, there are only a few ways of steering the boat without actually having a human being behind the wheel or at the tiller. And that is a really useful thing to be able to do on longer passages. Those options are electronic autopilot, wind vane, or sheet to tiller or sheet to wheel steering. But that last one is more of a backup to the backup to the backup. For each of these methods, there are pros and there are cons. And for me, they boil down to something like this. If we look at the electronic autopilots, those are by far the easiest of these options to use. And they can also be used when there is no wind. The downside is that they require electricity and they've got a bunch of electronic components. When it comes to the wind vanes, a big plus is that they use absolutely no electricity and it is a 100% mechanical device. The downsides are that they're a little bit more sensitive to sail trim compared to the autopilot. They also can't be used with no wind, but there's an asterisk there. They are a big bulky thing on the back of your boat. And then they can be, but does not have to be more expensive than electronic autopilots. The reason for the little asterisk here is because with like, for instance, the setup we'll have here aboard Athena, we'll have the option of adding a tiller pilot, which is an electronic autopilot, but specifically designed for boats with tillers to the wind vane, which means the wind vane can steer the boat but based on input from the tiller pilot and not the wind. So it will also be useful when, for instance, motoring in no wind. And when I mentioned that a wind vane can be, but does not have to be more expensive than an electronic autopilot, the setup we've got here aboard Athena is a great example of that. For instance, the combined price for the drive unit and the 
autopilot stuff for the Garmin Autopilot we've got is 3,700 euros, something like that, whereas the wind vane was only 2,200 euros. And then of course there is the last option of sheet to wheel or sheet to tiller steering. The big upside there is that it is basically free. All it requires is a bit of line and some kind of flexible material, like maybe some sort of bungee or some surgical tubing. The big downside is that it is fiddly and requires a lot more adjusting. Out of those three options, the electronic autopilot is by far the most commonly used solution. And I think that is also true for long distance sailors, despite what some people might try and convince you of. For instance, if you look at the ARC, that's the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, so meaning a trip across the Atlantic from 2014, I believe it was, there was 227 boats that took part of that. Only 20 of those boats had a wind vane, and out of all those boats, only two boats relied solely on a wind vane. If that's true, then why even bother installing a wind vane? Well, there might be some different scenarios that would make you do that. For instance, your boat might be super minimalistic with no electronics, or if you're like me, you like a backup for the backup of the backup, or also like me, maybe you like to just try new things and learn new skills. And I'm really looking forward to learning how to sail the boat with a wind vane. It's the next day. I've had a chance to peruse the installation instructions, which seem very thorough. Unfortunately, the wind has picked up quite a bit, so I think I'm going to hold off until tomorrow to start installing the wind vane. Instead, today, Ava's going to be organizing all of our lockers, and I will dig into this task, which is called Fix Leak from Exhaust. When we're underway, there are some things I check periodically, like the engine, the bilge, and also here inside of our cockpit locker. When I peeked in here, I noticed a tiny bit of water down here and some black streaks. I think that might be a leak from our exhaust, but uh, let's take a closer look and whatever it is, let's get it fixed. After having removed all of the lines we keep in the cockpit locker and also having removed the autopilot drive unit cowling, a bilge cleaner made short work of the nasty black stuff. With the locker mostly clean, I was able to squeeze in there and get a closer look to see if I could find the source of all this black stuff. My theory of it being the exhaust was correct, but it turned out to not be a leak in the sense that I had feared, but just the little vent on the muffler that had come loose. After that fortunate discovery and easy fix followed a few hours of cleaning to get rid of all the black stuff that had found its way past the engine, underneath the cabin sole, into the bilge, but then finally, after plenty of scrubbing, Athena yet again had a nice clean bilge. That leak was a lot easier to fix than I had feared. I checked all of the hose clamps and everything else in there and everything looks fine, so it was just that little venti doodad that had come loose. Ava's still in the midst of organizing. It does seem like the wind has come down quite a bit, so let me get started on the wind vane. The user manual for the Pro Vane, which also contains the installation instructions, is surprisingly high quality considering the size of the company. So that the installation instructions start out with this little diagram here where all of the items are labeled so you know what refers to what on the wind vane. And then there is just a bunch of steps you need to follow. Everything is really well illustrated, it's short, concise. Just a wonderful manual. There is a little bit of assembly required before we can get to actually bolt the wind vane onto the transom. We need to attach this upper part of the wind vane to the gearbox and I think there's one or two other steps. I think ProVane might have updated the design of the wind vane since they made the manual. In the manual, there's a gear down here, which is not present on the actual wind vane. Instead, we have this knob. But I actually think that might make the installation a little bit easier. We just have to bolt this together. The wind vane gets attached to the transom using these two legs and this hinge. Now because of the way Athena's transom is tilted, the hinge is going to be on top. I believe that is all the assembly that's required before we can get this thing lined up on the transom. Last I checked, stainless steel doesn't float and the manual does also mention it's a good idea to attach a safety line, a temporary safety line, for this part of the installation. 
With the wind vane very carefully lifted ashore, I mounted the vane to be able to get a measurement from the distance of the top of the vane to the hinge mount. I used that measurement to make absolutely sure that the vane would clear the solar arch before drilling the two holes in the transom. With the help of Ava and the safety line, I got the wind vane maneuvered into place and got the hinge mount securely through bolted to the transom. I've got the wind vane temporarily supported by the top hinge here and this line going to a winch. I've also adjusted the angle of the wind vane so that it's tilted two degrees. I know, I know, two degrees might sound a little bit odd considering that the boat is going to move a lot depending on the weight distribution inside of it. But the argument the manual makes for tilting this a little bit is that most boats tend to bury their transom a little bit when they're underway. And that is definitely true for Athena. By having that slight forward tilt on the wind vane, when the boat starts bearing the transom, the wind vane should straighten up and be a little bit more vertical. The only part of the pro vane installation I've been dreading a little bit is the installation of these legs. These are gonna support the bottom half of the wind vane and they're supposed to be mounted into this guy here by drilling an eight millimeter hole in the leg. The reason the holes aren't pre-drilled in the leg here is so that you can shorten it and also so you can adapt it to any kind of weird transom shape you might have. The reason I have been dreading this a little bit is because it is a right pain in the behind to drill stainless by hand. But if I can just get this mic'd up so I know where the holes are, then maybe I can find a guy with a drill press. An angle grinder with a cutting disc made short work of shortening the legs. But unfortunately, I failed to find a drill press. So in best cruising style, I made do with my yellow discount drill. After that, getting the legs lined up and secured to the transom was a breeze. The bottom part of the wind vane is now firmly secured in place. We might have to do a little bit of an alignment of the rudder later on, but for now it's good enough. Let's get the uh, counterweight here installed and then I think we can move on to the rudder. The rudder gets held in place by a single bolt down here. The manual does mention that it's a good idea to add a safety line in case the rudder pops off, you don't lose the rudder. The fabric here on the vane is just temporarily held in place. It's not very tight right now, but uh, we'll take care of that later. This should then slot onto here. I am very relieved that the vane can move around in all directions without hitting anything. That is certainly a good start. The Dyneema line we've used for strengthening the arch is going to have to change a little bit. It used to go across like that. Now we're going to have to have it come down to here. In a week or two, when we leave Lisbon, we should have plenty of time to play with this wind vane. The way this works is you point the vane into the wind. When the wind direction changes relative to the boat, this gets pulled to either side, and then that moves the rudder. The amount of rudder movement you get can be adjusted by moving this little knob here inside of the gearbox. This type of wind vane works completely independently of the boat's rudder. You can also get wind vanes where the boat's rudder is a part of the equation, but one of the big upsides to this type of design is that you basically have a built-in emergency rudder. Here inside of the gearbox, there is this little arm with two bolts on there. This is meant for installing a tiller on. This is where the custom bent tiller arm I showed you earlier comes into the picture. You just need to drill two holes in that, and then that is gonna sit right here. Okay, so that was that drill. Well, that was a bit of a failure, but uh, this is not really needed now. In case we need to use this as an emergency rudder, we can always jerry-rig something with some wood and that'll work fine. The reason for the stainless bit here is because I want to be able to add a tiller pilot at some point in the future as a backup to the backup of the backup. But uh, yeah, for now, we don't really need this. I spent a few hours fiddling with the arch, trying to find the best way of bracing it without interfering with the vane from the wind vane. We had some 5mm Dyneema in the rope locker. I figured I could use that to make some little Dyneema loops in the exact size I need. 
After having marked the length, I sat down and whipped up four loops. If you've never made a Dyneema loop before, it is super easy. It is basically just a matter of burrowing both ends inside of the loop, and presto, you have an insanely strong, very low stretch loop. This is what the new bracing for the arch looks like. It's not going to be as effective as the full-on cross brace we had before, but I think this is going to be good enough. Almost all of the flexing in our arch comes from the feet down here. It's a little bit of a design flaw, but uh, this bracing does a good job of dealing with that. Just in case you're not familiar with Dyneema, this is not any old piece of line. This is incredibly strong and has almost no flex. That's why it's a really good choice for the bracing. The low stretch of the Dyneema in combination with a turnbuckle down here means I can really torque down on these and make them incredibly tight. I'll still keep the uh, blue Dyneema cross brace handy just in case I'm mistaken about these guys. But uh, yeah, the vane should now be able to move freely and that means the wind vane is ready for sea trials. So that means I can go ahead and close this wind vane task. I have also cheated a little bit and um, reattached that locker door I showed you earlier off camera. So I can also go ahead and close the locker door task. Ava's been busy organizing all of the lockers aboard the boat. A huge task and we're not all the way done yet. We still have to do the aft cabin, but there's a bunch of my stuff in there. So uh, we'll uh, leave this in doing for now and then we'll uh, finish that next week. We have a rigger that's gonna swing by the boat on Monday to give his input on how to best solve the sheets task. In terms of the other tasks on the board, we're not really dependent on outside help. So uh, it's just a matter of the engine oil needing to show up and us having to go to a friend of ours to pick up a package from my parents. So yeah, it should be fairly smooth sailing next week. The wind vane task is by far the most time consuming of all of these tasks that's left in to do here. So I think we've made good progress this week. Um, we have almost everything we need for all of the other tasks. So yeah, fingers crossed for next week. Even though we still have plenty of tasks on the board, we're already starting to keep an eye on the weather. Yeah. Our neighbor boat is leaving for the Canaries tomorrow. We're not quite ready to go yet and next week looks a bit shite weather-wise mm -hmm. so uh, even if we were done we wouldn't be able to go next week so please keep your fingers crossed for good weather in about two weeks yeah as always feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget if you've enjoyed this video please remember to leave a like see, see you, you.